Welcome back. You know, the ASCII standard has been around since, well, really, I guess the existence of teletypes because it defined this table of translation between characters and hexadecimal representation of those characters. This standard has persisted, but you'll notice that it it's a seven bit standard. It only goes up to decimal 127. There have been extended uh, ASCII definitions made. And if we look at this one, uh, this is a definition made by IBM many, many years ago. Um, I believe coincident with the invent of the PC. Um, this is called IBM code page 437. Uh, and you can see that it, you know, it uses the uh, upper bit of an 8-bit code to define these new characters. As far as the elements of computing systems go, the authors defined a different standard. Uh, it looks something like this, where uh, starting at 128, we have a new line and we have arrow keys and so forth. So because we, we're creating our own hardware, we can make our hardware respond to any character code that it sees in the way that the authors of the book defined it. In addition, uh, it's important to know how a keyboard will express these type of characters because they, uh, for, for example, arrow keys are not expressed the way a character like, you know, the A key or the Z key are expressed. They, they are expressed with two byte codes. You can see here the make, this column right here is the make. The make is done by sending E0, and E0 means this is an extended code. And then there's a code that follows, which uh, defines you know, E06B as the make key for the left arrow. Now, not to be confused, if you look down here, you can see that 6B is also used to express keypad, keypad 4, but you'll notice there's no extended code in front of it. So the, the 6B, as far as scan codes go, definitely reused, right? But when you see E06B, that's how you know that you're dealing with the left arrow. And there are, you know, obviously other extended codes that uh, use this E0 prefix. And again, the hack computer defines all of these, which I believe are all extended code keystrokes. So what we need is some additional logic in our keyboard circuit to look for this extended code E0. Now you'll notice the, the break code defined here is E0, F0, and that, remember F0 is the familiar break code, and then 6B. Now, you might think, well, maybe we need three scan codes in our circuit to be able to contain all three of these to look for the break. However, we're already, you know, when we get a break in this position, our logic is already examining that for a break and basically nulling out or zeroing out the output when we see this. Um, the fact that this is an extended code doesn't really change the behavior of how break works. Uh, so I think we can get away with just simply using two scan codes and then simply taking different action when we see this, this E0 code. So let's see how we can go ahead and modify our circuit. So here's where we left off last time. Uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new validator. So we have this break validator that looks for the break code F0. We need a new one that looks for the extended code. So it's easy enough to just uh, copy and rob, so to speak. So what we're going to do is we're just going to copy all of this, create ourselves a... extended validator circuit, paste in what we just copied, and simply change this to E0. 
And maybe we'll change this label too, just to keep things consistent. So we know what we're outputting. We're outputting the extended code. And it looks like I missed my scan code. I guess my cut and paste didn't work exactly correctly. And there we go. And this is connected, yes? Yeah, it is. Okay, great. Okay, so that takes care of that. So let's wire in our extended validator. Let's get ourselves a little more room here. So let's move this down and then we'll put in our extended validator here. And we're looking for in scan code two, remember, because top of stack is always going to have the keystroke and then the second uh, scan code will contain, in this case, what we're looking for is E0. So we'll put scan code two as input to our extended validator. And then we just want to know whether the scan code is valid or not. So let's just create a tunnel. up here we'll call this uh sc2 valid Now, the question is, what to do, what to do with this? And it actually leads to a broader question of, well, how is it that we're going to represent these now new extended ASCII codes? I mean, I use the word ASCII loosely because they're not really part of the standard. But in any case, we have now a set of codes that are going to be above 7F. Uh, which are not shifted codes and they're not unshifted codes, they're extended codes, right? So uh, one idea I've got is to just, we can just put in another ROM that when we address starting from 8.0, uh, that ROM spits out the appropriate codes. So uh, what I'm going to do is move these down. Try to get enough room here. Let's copy this now. And uh, yeah, I guess we have enough room here. And there we go. So for our ROM, let's, uh, let's wire the address line since I forgot to do that in the last video. And uh, so now we've got the data line and we need to figure out how to output the right code under the right uh, circumstance, right? Uh, so what do, we, what do we need to have happen here? Well, when neither shift nor extended, in fact, let me, um, let me go ahead and add a tunnel. Here we go. So when neither shift nor extended is turned on, well then that's an unshifted code. And so we want the we want the, the character to come from here. And when shifted is on and extended is off, we want this ROM to put the code out. And when extended is on and shift is off, this is going to be the ROM we want. And then in the case where extended and shift is on which technically is not valid uh there is no shifted extended code defined um we'll just want to put a zero out so how can we how can we do all that well we can we can expand our multiplexer here 
let me uh, peel out this connect these connections, and we're gonna disconnect that. So if we define a multiplexer of two bits wide now, which gives us four different input options. Well, the first input option, and I'm gonna move this over a little bit. The first input option, the zero one, well, that's when neither shift nor extend is on. So that is this first ROM. Uh, shifted, we're gonna make that the second one. And then extended, and in fact, let me label this so we don't get confused about what this represents. All right, so that's our extended ROM. So this third value will be from the extended ROM, and then our fourth value is just going to be constant zeros. Now we can copy this one, can't we? Right, and then our mux will go back to that mux because this this is the mux that deals with uh, zeroing out uh, when we get a break. All right, so now how do we map the extended and shift flags into the mux? Well, we can do that with a splitter. And let's just turn this facing north. Uh, well, sorry, facing south. Wired in this way. So when we get a shift, that's defined as code one. So we need the shift mapped to the first bit, right? Because if we're talking binary, if the first bit is on, that means you're talking about one. And extended. And let's uh, let's point this north, shall we? It might make it a little easier to wire up. So when extended is on, uh, we've got that hooked up to two, right? So binary two is when this flag is on and this flag is off, right? So shift would then be presumably off. So we wire up extended like that. Now again, extended and shift both being on, that's going to yield this three here because one and two is three, which is going to put through the zero, which, which is what we want. I think extended character support is really that simple. Let's modify the ROM to put in an extended character so we can do some testing. So first of all, um, this Z key that I had had in before is not valid in the extended ROM. Um, but let's use, um, uh, let's map the left arrow, shall we? The left arrow is uh, code 130, which maps to a scan code of 6B. So let me go find 6B. So let's see. So this is 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, A, B. So that's B. And that should translate to decimal 130, which is um, hex 82. So, left arrow is defined there. So let me write down what I just said. It'll probably be a lot clearer. Let's do some testing. I'm going to reset my simulation and Let's just start out by putting in a Z key to make sure that nothing's been broken. So I'm going to put in the scan code for Z starting from uh, least significant bit to most significant bit. And we have this ROM positioned to 7A. It's unshifted Z, and we have on the output 7A. 
So, so far, so good. So let's try uh, a shift Z and confirm that we get 5A on the output. Okay, we've got the shift in. Now let's put in the Z key. Okay, now we have Z shifted in, and we should see 5A, and there we go. So we have the shift, shift key is turned on, feeding into our MUX, and the shift code from the second ROM, 5A, is passed to the output. So that's correct. So finally, let's test putting in the extended code for the left arrow key. So I'll reset my simulation, and we need to put in the extended code first so that is this that is this scan code right here so now the extended key is in i don't expect any change on the output i expect to see zero because this doesn't represent a valid key yet so now let's clock in the arrow key so we're positioned to our 82 which is our left arrow ascii code we see the extended flag has come on and 82 is passed to our output. So this circuit appears to be working. If you'd like to see more content about building the hack computer on an FPGA using Logisim, you can help my channel out by subscribing and liking the video. Link below, you'll find the next video in the series.